Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It's great to see such a crowd turn up. Uh, let me switch back to the presentation there. Can you hear me okay if I just talk like this? All right, great. Um, all right, so my name is Balan Siva. Um, I'm a, a Sydney boy, but I actually live in California now, and I work for Edis Research there. Uh, Edis Research makes software-defined radios. And um, my role there is sort of the SDR evangelist, so I like to tell people about some of the cool applications you can realize with software defined radio, and I'd like to sh share some of those with you today. So I'll just get things started here. Um, this is one of our products, just so you can see it up close. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the board and, and software defined radio concepts in general, and you can pass around and have a closer look. Can I just get a show of hands? Who actually knows that? <laughs> knows about software defined radio, who's heard of it and, and used it. Alright, quite, quite a few people. I see Noise Bridge t shirt there. Um, and GNU Radio? Who's who's from the GNU Radio? A couple of people. Alright, cool. So what I'll do then is I'll just give you a very um, brief introduction and a couple of demos just to give you a flavor of what you can do. But this is an example of a software defined radio. So it, the idea is that on one side you have antennas, so you plug in an antenna, and on the other side you have some interface that traditionally goes to a PC. And the idea is that with radios, generally speaking, they're all fixed functions. So if you think about the radios in your mobile phone, you've got Bluetooth, you've got Wi-Fi, you've got 2G, 3G, 4G. If you think about the radios that are in your car, you might listen to some FM broadcast in your car. It's specifically designed to pick up FM, AM, and so on. Those are fixed function radios. And software defined radio moves away from that and allows you to have reconfigurable and flexible radios where you actually define the functionality in software. So this board would give you a really, really basic, simple interface to the RF spectrum, and then it allows you to listen to it and pipe in that raw radio data into your computer, where you can use some software framework to implement your own custom radio, whether it be, in fact, an FM demodulator, just like the one in your car, or some really advanced 4G cell phone base station, which has actually been done already. Um, so if you actually look at this board, and I'll show you in a moment. It's got three sort of sections to it, which is sort of the traditional architecture. This chip here on the left-hand side is actually quite advanced. This contains the analog to digital converter, digital to analog converter, the synthesizers and mixers, everything that sort of is in a traditional radio front end is in this one chip. The chip in the middle is the FPGA. Who knows what an FPGA is? Yeah, so basically you write some uh, low-level code to configure all the logic in here, and this acts as the sort of intermediary between the radio front end and whatever transport mechanism you have out there. So this has the radio state machine in it and does some decimation and interpolation so you can sort of select the rate at which you want data to come out of the radio. And then finally you have some interface chip. And in this case, this device is USB 3. So this allows you to connect by USB 2 or USB 3 to a computer and that chip handles all that, um, that interfacing. So I'll pass this around and you can sort of have a closer look and as I, as I get on with the talk, um, compare that visually with what you have in your hand there. Um, so just before I look at the overview, um, I like to sort of travel around a bit and, and take, you know, if there are nice photo ops, take some nice photos. And here I was actually in Italy teaching an SDR lab and I thought, well, I'll get a nice sort of photo down by the Adriatic Sea and I had all these radios with me so that students could use it in a class. And it was quite a turnout. We had students from, I think, almost 25 developing nations um, and it was, it was a, a nice activity there. But unfortunately with me, it seems to be a pattern that um, these sort of types of people always turn up when I least expect it. So I was just minding my own business, taking photos there by the sea, and the, the carabinieri turned up. And uh, I learned my lesson because back here I was at North Head doing this sort of similar experimentation as well, and Pole Air just magically um, <laughs> rose up out of nowhere. And they were, you know, the, the police helicopter, I was holding the photo of the, the camera in my hand and pressed the shutter button. And, um, you know, police have come out and, and been wondering what I've been doing at near San Francisco airport and all that kind of stuff. So it can be an interesting time. But today I'd like to talk to you about some of the cool things you can do with software and radio. Looking first at spectrum monitoring, which is the idea that there's all this radio energy out there, all these sorts of interesting transmissions, and you can monitor and figure out what's going on where. Um, applying this to drones and first-person video vision. Uh, who's, who's actually mucked around with a drone or is interested in sort of drones and air, airborne stuff? Yeah. Um, so restaurant pages, 
uh, the ISEE3 reboot mission, talking to an old NASA space probe, uh, aviation radar, and some RFID applications as well. And a lot of this stuff has been done with GNU Radio. GNU Radio is an open source, freely available uh, SDR and digital signal processing framework that you can download. It's a really active and vibrant community. Lots of really cool applications there. And um, in sort of summary, the, the base layer is all C++ for performance. It gives you all sorts of uh, blocks that can do different sorts of DSP operations. And then you link them all together to achieve some sort of overall application. So if we look at this, this is actually a waterfall plot that's showing us energy within the radio spectrum. Um, is everybody kind of familiar with, with what this means? So from left to right is frequency, top to bottom is in time, and the intensity of the pixels are the amount of RF energy at that point in the radio spectrum. Uh, so can anybody actually to hazard a guess as to what part of the spectrum we're looking at here? Any guesses? Don't be shy. 2.4? Not quite 2.4. Something that's also quite popular. Mm, a little bit higher than 700. Common radio devices we use every day. <laughs> it's quite funny. I haven't had sort of precise frequencies. What about more the application? What 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 devices do you think are causing these sorts of transmissions or listening to them? People. Mm -hmm. People. Yeah, that's it. They're mobile phones. This is a cell band. So what you can actually see here is this narrow strip in the middle is actually two G G S M. This is a broadcast control channel coming down from a base station. And then the, the wider ones on either side are probably 3G or some higher bandwidth mobile uh, carrier there. And then you can see these bursts, these tiny little bursts on the side there. They're traffic, periodic traffic that's being sent in the time slot that's allocated to somebody's mobile phone. So this is just one of the interesting signals out there. And whenever you see any of these backgrounds, that's when it'll be um, sort of an example of, of the signals that I'm looking at. Um, so, that actual photo was taken from this program. This is one of my favorite programs called Boardline. It's a really neat analysis tool. And here, this is actually streaming in 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth in real time from one of these devices. And it basically means that with uh, the technology we have nowadays and the interfaces that we have available to us nowadays, like 10 gigabit Ethernet and USB 3, you can pull in a huge amount of the radio spectrum at once into your computer. And you can actually then visualize an enormous amount, much more than you could previously. So that's 50. If we actually look at this running in real time, you see those narrow channels that now that are on the right-hand side. And you see these traffic bursts appear every so often there. And what's interesting about the broadcast control channels is you see how every so often you just have this distinct little line there? Does everyone see that? What that line is, is it's a special series of uh, bits in the data that are fixed that produces this single tone for a short period of time. And in GSM, your phone will actually listen to that fixed tone, and it will discipline its internal oscillator to the base station. So the frequency referencing your phone will then be matched up with the base station, and then you can communicate effectively. Um, newer modulation schemes and more advanced mobile schemes use a different technique, but that was one really neat thing about GSM. Um, because if your phone is slightly off from the base station, then it won't be able to communicate properly. So, speaking of mobile phones and base stations and GSM, one of the first things I'd like to show you actually is this, which is running right here uh, 2G GSM base station. So, I would encourage you, if you game, to get your mobile phone out if it's unlocked and switch to Mario manual carrier selection mode and have a look for a network that doesn't belong. And these are some of the phone numbers there. My phone number is 2104 and what I can do is I can switch over to the console and this should show activity as we try and do things with the base station. So what's cool about this setup is that you're looking at the board that's going around is actually an SDR with a USB 3.0 interface on it that needs to be connected to the, the computer. This board here is actually another product. It's the E300, E310. But this is an SDR and an embedded computer in the one unit. 
So this is a dual core ARM processor running Linux and GNU Radio, and this base station, which is OpenBTS, it's a completely open source 2G GSM base station, plus a soft switch. Oh, somebody's logging on. And what's even cooler is that it's running off this battery pack. So this is a completely portable mobile phone base station. So that's just sitting here running the, running the software, and you can see something's happening there. If you successfully log on, you should receive a text from 101 saying welcome to the network. And then if you want, you can text back to 101 at least a four-digit phone number, which will then be reserved as yours on the network if it hasn't already been taken. So just to give you an example, I've got my two phones here that are on the network and I shall attempt to call myself. You see some activity there, and it's making, putting through the call, and then now, <coughs> that's working, let's see what happens. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hello, hello. So, not only does this support calls, but it also supports texts. So, did anybody manage to log on? Yeah. Yeah, so does anyone try, want to try giving me a call? 2104? Let's talk about it at the end. <laughs> um, I, it's not ringing. Anyone? Yeah, it's more. Oh, it's ringing now. Here we go. Hello? Oh, yeah, there he is. Hello. How are you going? I was going to get the pizza. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for the update. See you later. Um, so if you want to try calling me, go ahead. And also, if you want to try sending a text, then that will work as well. So, I mean, this is, this is sort of a more advanced application that you can realize with software-defined radio. And it's all open source. You can just download the software and set it up. Um, and what I'd like to show you, actually, is this is running here. But I've also got this other USRP B210 that's hooked up to my laptop. And I want to show you how you can use this other thing to actually look at the signals that are being transmitted by another system, which happens to be this base station here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to... Um, Let me switch over to this application. This is HDSDR. It's, it's a SDR application, receiver application for Windows. And it allows you to um, connect to a bunch of different SDRs via this plugin. Um, a while back, I wrote a plugin to enable it to talk to these USRPs. And you can start it, and it will actually stream live uh, at, at the frequency that you want. So when you set the frequency here, it programs the front end of the radio to tune to that. And then it streams in the, the live data. So I've tuned to this particular frequency. And what we're looking at here is the downlink channel that's being transmitted by our little base station here. So this is constantly going. Obviously, it's broadcasting information about the cell. And when your phone does the scan, it will find this and then uh, realize it's a network that it can register with. So this is the downlink. This is always active. Now, what happens if we look at the uplink frequency? So this is the frequency at which the base station is listening. Oh, I got a text. What time zone? Yeah, sorry about the time zone. That's one, one problem. We need to set it back. Um, so this is looking at the uplink now. So this is looking at the signals that are being transmitted by your mobile phones back to the base station. And you can see every so often there's some activity because maybe you're registering or maybe you're sending a text. Um, but if you actually... Does anyone else want to try and call me again? 2104? So you can see there's some activity there. Somebody's trying to establish a call. I got, I got three texts now. So there's obviously lots of stuff happening there. Somebody's trying to establish a call, maybe. Is anyone, anyone trying to call me? Yeah, busy. Oh, no, there we go. 6374, who's that? Yeah, there we go. So you can see now there's um, quite a bit of traffic because it's trying to set up the call. And if I answer, hello, hello? Yeah. Oh, so I can hear you, right? So you, basically we have constant traffic now because our phones are both sending the audio back to the base station constantly. Oh, 2599, testing, gotcha. And then when we hang up, it'll terminate the call and then shut it down and it goes back to this sort of bursty mode. And remember, this is all a particular kind of uh, digital modulation, which is why it has this characteristic shape on the Hello? Someone else is calling? Oh, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> Um, so I think the pizza's here. So we'll have a pizza break in a minute. Let me just show you one more demo. All right. Um, so 
this is a, you know, a neat way of looking for activity on the radio spectrum. Now, this is a digital modulation technique. Let's have a look at an analog, traditional analog modulation technique. So what we've got here now is just FM. And I have this little handy talky amateur radio transmitter. And I must give you the disclaimer, I have an amateur radio light. So I could go, I can key down and say, Vic Kilo 2, Fox Stroke Uniform, November Kilo. And you can see this is my little signal here. Now if we actually click on that and unmute, you should be able to hear me coming through the speaker. So I'm transmitting to this radio, which is being receiving, sending the raw spectrum through to this application. And because I've got FM selected, it's going to demodulate that FM signal. But you can do AM, upper side band, lower side band, other sorts of things as well. And it's interesting because you can see that as I speak, it's an analog modulation, so you can see the actual signal there vary with the energy going to the microphone. The other thing is you can also tell how well a transmitter might be working. So if you have a look, this is actually a really bad transmitter because you'll see these whiskers pop out when I key down, right? See these? That's not good. <laughs> um, and so I like the text from 1135. Um, so that's analog. And now finally, one little, one little um, tidbit that I'd like to show you. This mobile phone base station running on the E310, that's the bare board. But here, this is the, the same product, but in a, in a nice case. And you're welcome to have a look. Um, here, I actually got this thing transmitting something special on a loop. And if we tune up to that frequency, it's not a signal that you would actually listen to or try and demodulate. It's something that you would look at on a waterfall. Let's, let's have a look. <laughs> so Matt Edis founded at Edis Research, and he looks <laughs> like that. <laughs> I mean, a little bit more human and colorful than real life, but you get the idea. I think we can... Uh, waterfalls are already running pretty quickly. Yeah, there we are. So what's happened here is that I've actually created a bitmap. I wrote a program ages ago that would take on these bitmaps and then synthesize audio at the particular frequencies, like a, a reverse FFT, essentially, or an inverse FFT. Mm -hmm. And then I took that audio file, put it into GNU Radio, and then it would make it more amenable to transmission over the radio frequencies. And so you can do this kind of trickery with it, if you like. All right, so we were looking at 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth coming from one of these USERPs. Here we're actually looking at 100 megahertz worth of bandwidth now. This is on another device called the X310 that has a 10 gigabit link or PCI Express link to your computer. So you can actually send through much more data. And this one's interesting because in the 400 meg band, you can see that there are all these periodic signals that occur and trunk and control channels and bursts of data. And it's, it's um, cool to be able to visualize such a, a wide swath of the spectrum. This one here is actually 200 mega samples per second, about 120 megahertz worth of a useful RF bandwidth. And this one's interesting because it's an ASCII art FFT. So let's say you were using some low bandwidth link and you were SSHing in somewhere else and you couldn't you know, afford an X connection, what have you. You can kick it old school and just use ASCII art to render out your radio spectrum. And here we're actually looking at essentially all of the FM radio stations at once. So if you ever wanted to figure out which car I'm driving, it's the one with all the antennas <laughs> on the roof. And um, this is a little bit of a setup that I had in Las Vegas, driving around, and I've got the SDRs in the back there, the B210, which is going around, and the X310, which is that 10 gigabit one, going into the laptop. And it's actually running some spectrum monitoring code. It's um, a Python program that I, I knocked up, and it uses GNU Radio to talk to these things, and it continually steps through the radio spectrum, pulls in some data, does some analysis, um, and you can enhance it with plugins. So this is what it kind of looks like. If you um, if you have a look here, it's sort of separated into these iterations, and then every iteration it moves to a different frequency sample. But, and then if you have the, the graphing enabled, it will actually show you the energy in the spectrum there. So the blue is the average power, the red is the peak power, maximum power, and then the green is the minimum for each of those bins in your fast Fourier transform. And as you step through, then it'll It'll sort of look like this as you move through and you'll see different sort of signals appear. Uh, and the cool thing is these units can also have a GPS module plugged into them. 
And when you do that, you actually get position as well, obviously, and then you can spatially tag each point where you sample some of the spectrum and then you know where that was reported. Uh, it also allows you to add other sort of Python plugins. And in this case, this is energy detection. So you create this spectral mask here in blue, and if energy, any energy exceeds that mask, then it will trigger a hit, and this is being shown there in red. And then it'll actually log that, so it'll say, at this particular frequency, this wider signal was detected at this particular power level. And then you can use that to trigger something else if you like. Um, and so usually if your spectrum might be devoid of signals and suddenly something's there, it can, it can trigger something. So what you can do then as you're stepping through these frequencies is that at each stage you, you sample some of the spectrum and you, you create an FFT so you can look at the frequency response in that, in that section. But then you do them uh, through an entire band here and then build up these really, really wide band FFTs. So here we're looking at the mobile phone bands and you can see all of the different sort of carriers uh, and broadcast control channels like we saw before but over a very, very wide range. Not in real time, because it's iterating through them, but you can create an image after that. And here, this is an even wider one where you're looking at 2.4 gigahertz ISM, which is what somebody mentioned before earlier. And you can see all of the different carriers, for example, the Wi-Fi traffic, some of the Bluetooth traffic, Bluetooth traffic, and you can get an idea of the activity in the band. And so this is what's been going around. This one here is B210. And it's really cool because USB 3, it's bus power, so you just plug in your laptop, you don't need your external power. You can go up to 56 megahertz worth of usable bandwidth, and it's got this significant frequency range that you can tune through from 70 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. And what's neat about it is that if you add an up converter in front that'll multiply low frequencies up to higher ones, you can essentially get all the way down to the low end of the spectrum, almost to DC, so all the interesting long wave HF sort of signals out there. The difference between the 200 and the 210 is that the 200 has one RX and one TX, so one transmit, one receive port, and the 210 has two receive and two transmit ports. And when you have two by two, then you can do this thing called MIMO, which is multiple in, multiple out. And it means that you can use antenna diversity to improve your digital modulation scheme. Um, so that's a, that's a neat additional <coughs> feature. And in addition, these are also full duplex, so you can simultaneously transmit and receive. Now, before I move on to the drones, um, I just wanted to quickly show you that spectrum monitoring code. I can start up the Python server on my laptop here. And on this separate unit, um, I actually have the code already on here. Look into that. <coughs> Excuse me. It's been happening in my presentations re re recently. <laughs> At one particular point, I get the urge to sneeze and then... I don't know why, you know, when you look into a bright light source, it just sets it off. Um, so this actually has the code on it. And you'll notice on this one, I actually have this Ethernet cable plugged in. You've got USB and Ethernet and other, other things on, in this device. But in this case, I just have the Ethernet there so that it'll send the data through to my laptop, which will actually show it on the screen. You can also get those USB LCD dis displays to plug in to give you a graphical front end for this using display link. But in this case, I'm just going to use the um, I, um, an RPC graphing server that I put together. So that's running on my laptop. And we should see something come up. So now if I bring up the terminal, I've SSH into the device, and I'm going to run the scanner. So that's going to start up there. 91660, I'm sorry. There's no backhaul to the plain old telephone service. So these graphs have come up. And so this is looking at actually that uplink frequency that we're looking at for the mobile phone. So you can see there that there's a sort of burst on the left-hand side and then noise. And if we look at the frequency domain, it's constantly sampling, and it looks like this. So this is centered, like in that previous waterfall we saw, on our um, spectrum that we have running with the base station. So if I set up a call again, we should see a huge amount of activity. Let's see what happens. There we go. See that? So this is, again, that carrier that's being broadcast from each mobile phone. And then there's some energy there. And you can see, because it's um, every so often, because GSM uses time division multiple access, each phone is assigned a slot in time where it can transmit. You can see that here you have noise down the bottom, and then you have the signal. So it's actually, that's the slot there. That's the burst of data coming from the mobile phone. And it just happens to sample when it goes up and back down again. And if I hang up, 
then that should settle back down again to the quiet idle state. There we go. Uh, and so this is obviously looping on that same frequency over and over again, as you can see here. But you can set it up to scan completely different ranges and do a certain number of iterations, and, and it's pretty flexible. It's all in Python, and it's, it's um, it can be quite quite handy. So I'll shut that down. And get back to this. So drones are really cool and caught my attention because you can put something on them. They they will take some sort of a payload. And I went to a meet up there in, in Berkeley, and I was pretty taken with what I saw. And what's even cooler is that they actually do drone racing. The Mate magazine came out and they did a bit of a piece there and they do the sort of racing. <laughs> and everybody wears the FTV goggles so they can see the point of view of the drone. There's a camera on the drone and it downlinks the video from the drone in real time to their goggles. The problem is that it's actually an analog signal they're broadcasting NTSC over FM from the goggle, from the uh, camera on the drone to the goggles. And it also is occupying a very wide bandwidth. And the problem is then that people on the ground have to coordinate the frequencies that they use so that they don't interfere with one another. Otherwise, you won't be able to receive a clean video signal. So it's susceptible to interference from natural sources, and you'll get files and white noise and so on, but it's also susceptible to other transmissions and so you have these conflicting video signals and people have to basically maintain a ledger where they write what, what channel they're using. So that's a bit of a problem and I thought it would be interesting to look at that. Um, so I got a drone, this is the 3D Robotics X8 Plus and it has eight motors on there and that's because it can actually lift a significant payload. And the very first time I flew it was very exciting, I'd never done it before. That's what I'm talking about! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, they, and it's really incredible. I mean, it can fly for about 15, 20 minutes, depending upon the payload. But you control by remote control. It has an autopilot. It can land itself. It can um, go through waypoints. It can um, hover. And it's just they're really cool. Um, and it also has a radio modem on there. And you can link it up to your laptop and actually receive telemetry from it in real time. And here we're at a park. And you know, it's showing you GPS, altitude, and battery levels, and, and so on. Um, and that's cool to track it. So what I thought I'd do is I put one of these E310s as the payload on the drone. And here you actually see there is a <coughs> Wi-Fi USB dongle that I've plugged in there and turn this into an access point. So I can fly the thing as a flying access point and then connect my laptop to it via wireless. And then that spectrum monitoring code that I showed you, I'm actually running there on the E310, flying on the drone up in the air and it's sending the data back down to my laptop. And why I wanted to look at that was if you consider that on the ground, your radio and your antennas will only be able to see a certain amount. And you're in an urban canyon, so you're going to have existing structures that might cause um, the signal to bounce around, and you won't be able to have line of sight for distant transmitters. So you won't have a very strong signal. But if you put it up in the air, then you're going to have the advantage of the altitude, and you will have line of sight to many, many more transmitters that have a stronger signal coming in. So this is an example here where the ground level, we had about this level of these signal, I think this is my, maybe the mobile phone band there, but then 25 meters up in the air, it was actually 20 dB higher, so that's a significant increase in power, and that's just, you know, having one of these things and lifting it up on a drone, you don't have to climb up anywhere, um, and you can fly it around, so a further bit of study that I'm going to do with this is actually do direction finding, so you can try and ascertain where the signal is coming from on this airborne platform. Now, back to the racing and the FPV, Trying to address this problem of shared um, frequency usage and spectrum coordination, I thought it'd be interesting to do a digital video downlink instead. So I put this webcam on the drone, and you can actually plug the webcam by USB into one of these radios. And then on the bottom is the E310 again. And in this case, the E310 is sampling imagery from the webcam and then sending it over a custom radio link that's been designed in GNU Radio, quite simply, and then it's being transmitted over the air, and then it's being received by the laptop with another radio, and just showing you the, the live digital image there on the right-hand side. And every time it sends out a frame, this is a waterfall, and every one of these red blocks is a burst of frame video data. And funnily enough, 
In this instance, this example, I'm using the same modulation scheme as what is being used by the 2G GSM standard, which is GMSK, Gaussian Minimum Shift Key. And this is uh, an example of the flow graph in GNU Radio. GNU Radio has at the very highest level this graphical environment where you can drop these digital signal processing blocks down, link them up, and then run this program. So this is the transmitter. It takes in by UDP socket the frames and modulates them, and then usually on one side or the other, you have um, in the bottom right hand corner here the sync of all the, of the modulated data, which happens to be the USRP, the software defined radio. And then the receiver is just the reverse of that. You have the SDR receiving here, it goes into the demodulator and then looks for the packets and then outputs them up on the socket to be processed by the video uh, deframer. So this is what it looked like when we tested it out. Uh, I had the laptop there listening with the with a B210 receiving that downlink signal. So I've got the GoPro on the back there, but the webcam's on the front, and it's transmitting the live video frames down, and they're being displayed here on the side of the screen. Now the thing that's worth noting is, because it's a digital transmission, if you get the frame, it's going to be crystal clear. There won't be any corruption there whatsoever. So you either get the frame or you don't. And I spin around and it's just looking back at us and we get the, the live video feed. And one issue there is latency. It's not going to have as good as latency with this analog thing, but this is only a very quick prototype, so I'm hoping to improve that in the future. And then the cool thing is that you can send this really high up into the air, and then essentially you end up looking inadvertently into people's backyards. <laughs> so and you can get really interesting images from high up. <laughs> it's, um, you know, you wouldn't normally consider seeing. So here we have the, the we're about 26 meters up in the air. Um, it, there's actually 35 amps going through the um, the motors at 15 volts. So quite a bit of power there to keep the thing up in the air. And you can see there people's houses, and that was the waterfall of the transmission coming down. And you just you know fly it around and obviously avoid stationary objects and power lines, and apart from that, you're good. So, uh, in the actual prototype then, I used QPSK, so I was doubling the, the throughput, and then it goes through a frame pass and then the display. Uh, and then here, the waterfall, that's what the signal looks like. And then, yeah, 25, 26 meters up in the air. So this was the, the one of the frames coming down. Um, you know, I had to make some compromises, so it's not the best fidelity, but as you can see, you can see um, this is the frame from the GoPro, so it's pretty cool having a little camera up there, and this is sort of the goal where I'd like to take this uh, in the future. Um, so that's, that's drones and, and digital video downlinks. Uh, now with restaurant pages, I'm sure you've been to a restaurant where you order some food and then they give you one of these beepers and it goes off when it's, it's ready to be picked up. The rate at which you order and collect food should be roughly the same unless everybody gets paged at once. So how do you determine how these systems work? Well, you can either look at the frequency on the back of the pager, or you can look at the frequency on the website of the government authority that's managing the licenses. Or you can actually just use one of these SDRs, shoot around until you find the frequency. So that's the example there, where I was at a restaurant and I found the, the frequency they were using the, uh, uh, with their transmitter. And then once you actually look at the signal, you can then determine what modulation scheme they're using. So here, you can see that you have this frequency that's deviating between two particular points. So this is frequency shift key. So when it's on one side, it's, it might be a zero. When it's on the other side, it might be a one. And the other clue is that you see how it's actually transitioning between these two states very, very frequently. That gives us an additional clue as to what's going on. So the first step is that you record the data, and then you focus in on the signal of interest, which is this thing called channel selection. And then the next thing is to determine how far it's deviating from the center of the dial. And this is the FSK deviation. So you can look at that very simply at the FFT plot and figure that out. And once you've got that number, you move on to the next step, which is actually doing the FM demodulation. What happens is it turns that frequency deviation into this time domain deviation. As you can see here, we've got a very nice deviation between one and negative one. And clearly we have some sort of signal coming out here. And there's some sort of digital binary data encoded in this, in this analog signal. And the next step then is we need to figure out how quickly that data has been transmitted. Uh, we need to figure out the board rate. So, you know, the common example I always use is back in the dial-up days with the modems, 
we'd say, you know, oh, I've got a 14.4 modem, and then somebody would come up and say, no, oh, I've got a 28.8k modem. And, and that's the same idea. You need to figure out how quickly those ones and zeros are being sent. And you can do this using this simple um, little construction. It's called cyclostereoscenary analysis. So you multiply the original signal by a delayed version of itself, do the FFT, and then when you have the first largest peak there, that's actually how fast the data is being sent. It's indicative of the periodicity of um, the content of your signal. And once you know that, once you know how often the, in time the ones and zeros are going through your stream, then you can put it into this clock recovery block that will actually sample your analog stream at the precise point in time to output a one or a zero. So this is converting from now this analog domain into the digital domain. And once you have your ones and zeros there, you can do some more analysis. So here, as we said before, you have all these transitions between one and zero and zero and one. It doesn't look like a normal data packet. You would normally expect to have long strings of zeros or ones. And this is a clue because it's indicative of the line encoding used. When you have all these sorts of transitions, it's so that the receiver can more easily lock onto the transmission. And so this is an example of Manchester encoding, where for every pair of binary bits, it actually decodes to one. So if it goes from zero to a one, or a one to a zero, it's a valid Manchester pair. But if you have a one one or a zero zero, it's an invalid Manchester pair. And when you select the appropriate Manchester decoder, then you get half the number of bits, and you get something that looks like a real data packet. You can see now we have long strings of zeros. So that looks better now. The next step is then to determine what's going on within the packet. So packets usually have some sort of a header associated with it to train the uh, decoder on the receive side. So you have this fixed pattern there. And then you need to figure out what changes in the packet between two different pages, which is obviously going to be indicative of the ID of who your page is. And you can compare two different pages, two different transmissions, and see here in green which bits are different. And that gives you a clue as to where they're actually encoding the ID. You'll see also at the end here, we have different bits. And commonly with packets, there's some sort of CRC or hash that's put on the end so that the receiver can verify the validity of that frame. So obviously, if you change an ID, you're going to get a different checksum at the end. Now, once you know your own ID and capture the radio waves when you are paged, you can very quickly see where the ID is encoded. And then, you need to also figure out the checksum algorithm. And you can try a whole bunch, and I just happened to try a whole bunch and I found that it was the simple one where you sum up all the bytes, multiply 255, and then voila, you get the CRC. And then you can make a transmitter. So here, this is a Python uh, block that will output a correctly constructed frame. It goes into an interpolator, frequency modulation, rational resampler, and then out into the SDR. So this is the reverse of that decoding process. And then you get a program like this where you type in the address of the pager that you want to set off, and then it will actually transmit out the page over the air. And when you record that, you can actually then compare it to the original one, and what do you know, it actually looks kind of similar, so you can hope, well, maybe things might actually work. So, what happens when you test it out? And then what you can do is you can invite all your colleagues out to lunch, take a laptop, say you're just recording some more information off the airwaves, but actually run this with your Wi-Fi in ad hoc, or with your laptop in Wi-Fi ad hoc networking mode, and then create an XML RP6 server on the laptop that you can bring up on your smartphone, go inside, pretend you go to the bathroom, and actually activate it remotely. So Matt Edis founded the company. That's him there. I looked at the pager that he had. Went inside. <coughs> this is really interesting because he's confused, the poor lady is confused because the order should be ready when the page went off, right? And he knows that whenever I turn up with my little GoPro, I'm up to something. <laughs> Which is why he says that um, I'm making him nervous. But it was just, it was really interesting to see that sort of social reaction to it too. Um, and now one other thing is that I have this slider there, 
So if you were to drag that slider from the left hand side to the right hand side, you can imagine that it will actually set off all the pages. Um, I must say that I never did it myself, but it might have been done, and it was really quite something to see everyone get up in the restaurant. <laughs> so there's another page in standard that uses POCSAG. This is the, the radio protocol that's used by the old beepers, the old pages. And you can get these out of tree modules for GNU Radio that Im allow you to import some external code and then, and then demodulate stuff. So here, this is running there, that POCSAG decoder, and you can see the frames coming out there as it picks them up. And then once you do a bit of analysis, you can figure out how that page ID is encoded. Here, I'm going into the details. But um, again, you can create a transmitter, 46. You can see it going up there. 46 goes off, and then we'll my do 39, and then we'll do 56, and then we'll do 83, and then 82, and 78. What's the board? <laughs> How about 56? 56 didn't go off because there was a small issue that I needed to tweak. And then the third kind of pager is really interesting because these ones are given to you when you order at the counter. You go and sit down at the table and the table has an RFID tag on the underside that this reads and then transmits the table ID back into the kitchen so that when they bring you your order, they know where to take it because they know where you're sitting. So every time you put it down on the table, it's transmits something back. And there's another out of tree radio, uh, out of tree module for GNU radio that you can download that will happily transmit and receive Zigbee. And this is a very simple flow graph to give you the idea of the stack. When you run this, this is the sort of setup there in the restaurant, it's happily decoding the frames there and printing them out. And then you can hook it up to Wireshark and decode the frames. And then once you've got the IDs, and I actually went back into the kitchen to look at their screen to see what table we were sitting at because there was no other way that I would know that bit of information. All these numbers very clearly line up with the data in the packet. So again, it's all in the clear, it's all open, um, and you have you know, now the capability to receive and transmit. So let's move on now to signals coming from the heavens as opposed to looking at these terrestrial signals. T did anybody follow or hear of the ISE3 reboot project? Yeah, a couple of people. So this was based around this old NASA space probe that was launched in 1978. It was the International Science Explorer. There were three probes sent out, and we were um, looking at the third one. It was put into a heliocentric orbit after it finished its mission. But it was initially designed to study the interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. So it had a whole bunch of science instruments on board to measure this sort of stuff. It was later renamed to ICE, and it was the first spacecraft for a couple of different things. The first one would be put into this Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point, which is a special gravitational point between the Earth and the Sun that's stable, and as the Earth rotates around the Sun, it sort of drags it along with it. NASA had an experiment with it, so this was the first there. And it was also the first spacecraft to pass through the tail of a comet. Lots of other nations had probes already sent out to go fly through uh, Halley, but the US didn't. So they repurposed this one so they could be the first and beat everybody else. And one of the boffins at NASA was able to visualize this incredible trajectory and orbital maneuvers and plan everything out so that it would pass through the comet and, and enter different points at, at precise points in time. Incredible how he was able to visualize all this and design it. Um, so this is that L1 point between the Earth and the Sun and then going through the comet later on. But it also did all these maneuvers picking up um, energy around the Earth. So if you actually look at that, you'll see here that the Earth is at the center there, the Moon is on this orbit around the Earth, and then the Sun is all the way back there. The L1 point is here. So they sent and did some orbits around L1, then it did some slingshots around the Earth and the Moon to pick up energy, and then eventually did the lunar flyby, the last one, and then it went out into its orbit around the Sun. And this is what the probe looks like. It's spin stabilized, so it's constantly spinning, and it has thrusters on board so they can maneuver it, plus it has some radio gear on there that operates at about the two gigahertz band. And this is one of the old telemetry screens that NASA used to actually receive the telemetry and then show information about the propulsion system, the electronics, and other subsystems. Now, the, if you look at the orbit, before I play that completely, NASA you know, use the probe, the probe fulfills its mission, they run out of funding, and then they put the probe into a graveyard orbit to orbit around the sun. And because they ran out of funding, NASA also got rid of all of the old radio gear that they had used to previously communicate with the satellite. 
So once it had been put in its graveyard orbit, it would go around, and as you can see from the date here, it's moving along pretty quickly, and as we approach 2014, then the probe is actually catching up with the Earth. And as you can see here, the closer we get to the middle of last year, it's catching up with the Earth. So it was going to come back and do the next lunar flyby. And what happened was in 2008, some amateur radio people in Germany picked up the signal coming from the space probe, considered that the batteries had long since died. It was only powered from the energy being collected by the solar panels. And the transponders had been left in a mode where they were only transmitting the carrier. There was no information on it, it was just saying, I'm alive, I'm here, here's my carrier. And they picked that carrier up. So after all this time, the spacecraft was ostensibly still working, and it was coming back to Earth. So the reboot mission was formed, this is sort of a pretty visualization of that, that orbit, returning at around that point late last year. The reboot mission was formed, they did crowdfunding to raise money, they assembled a team, and the idea was to bring it back into orbit around the Earth, fire the thrusters to do that, and then turn the science instruments back on and open it up for public science. So we're a pretty cool mission. But to bring it into orbit around the Earth, we needed to fire the thrusters, and the closer that it would get to the Earth, the more fuel would need to be burnt to achieve that course correction. And so there was a hard deadline to actually get all this rolling. So if you consider what's called the, the delta V, which is the change in velocity to bring it back into orbit, there's only a limited amount of fuel that we hoped was on there. There were some NASA logs that indicated potentially how much was left. And so once you reach your maximum delta V, which is equivalent to the amount of fuel on board, you can't make the maneuver anymore, so all hope is lost. So the idea was to try to get things moving as soon as possible. And the first step then was to try and communicate with the space probe. So how do you do that? Well, you go to the biggest radio telescope on the planet, which happens to be the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. Does anybody recognize this from, say, a couple of movies? Yep, Goldeneye and... The other one? No? Contact. So, this was a really interesting opportunity to show the power of SDR because NASA had thrown away all of their previous gear to talk to it. So we had to recreate the modems to talk to the space probe using the SDRs and GNU radio. And Arecibo is pretty amazing. This entire thing here is called the platform with the dome hanging off there. The dome actually contains multiple stories of receivers and transmitters. It's huge. And um, you have some steering ability because the dish itself is built into the ground, but the dome can move along this azimuth arm and the entire platform can rotate, and that gives you some amount of steering. And the scale is just, it's enormous. It's, um, it's a thousand feet across, 300 meters in diameter. <coughs> so you can actually go up onto the platform and we need to do that. We had a custom built power amplifier to operate the frequency that we needed. It was shipped international FedEx overnight from Germany. So we have to bring it down there and, and install it there. Um, and then we brought the FDRs over and back at the control center, we would hook them up to their big patch panel that would give us access to the receiver and transmitter that we had up in the dome. And then we sort of got working. My colleagues have done some uh, techno archaeology, as they like to call it, going through all the NASA documentation, trying to understand how to talk to the space probe. And there's a lot of conflicting information there as well that we had to resolve. So we had to take that into account in the software because we only would have two hours and approximately 45 minutes a day to get all this set up, trying to send the commands out to wake it back up. So the time was very short. We needed to be able to flick through all these permutations um, to make sure that we could try everything. And so uh, this was the signal coming back initially. It was very, very weak signal, just above the noise. And it was because the ephemeris that's programmed into the tracking computer at receiver was slightly off. And so this, you can see here, is this diagonal line on the waterfall plot. Can anybody tell me why it's diagonal and not, not straight, since it, it's just a carrier? Doppler, Doppler shift, that's exactly right. So if you consider all the parts that are moving in the system, the Earth is rotating, because the dish is in the Earth, plus the space probe is shooting toward the Earth and the Moon at about 4.2 kilometers per second. Here it was about 15, 5 million kilometers away from the Earth heading toward us pretty quickly. So once they did some manual sky search, we were able to get a much stronger signal from it because we were looking directly at the space probe. And then it came the time when we would try and send the commands out to the probe to wake it back up again, turn the telemetry back on so that we could assess the health of the spacecraft and see how it was doing. And here, just as I showed you before how you can monitor the spectrum to see what signals are out there, we're sending the commands out and I'm just standing there with this B200, 
set to the frequency that we're transmitting at to actually verify that the signal that we're generating is actually going out onto the air. So most of it is going up out of the dish, but some of it will leak over the side inevitably. And so here, obviously, then you can check that the entire system is working. And this is what happened, eventually. That's my friend Austin. And this was the moment where suddenly that carrier became modulated with telemetry. So the probe had received the command we'd sent to process it correctly, and then turned some of the systems on to send the data back down. And this is what it looked like. We were listening on two different frequencies, because there were two transponders on board. And you can see here that modulated telemetry there um, on the FT and the waterfall. So this was, a, this was a great first step. And then GNU Radio was used initially to do some of the decoding, tracking the carrier. And then I wrote some Python code that would eventually take the raw output of the demodulator, those raw ones and zeros, and per the NASA specs, parse them, and then give us information, like that old telemetry screen, about the state of the probe. So here we're looking at things like 20 volt bus current, um, the other voltages, um, the state of the two redundant hydrogen propulsion systems, the spin rate, the angle to the sun, um, the status of the latch valves on the propulsion system. And this is actually what it sounds like. <laughs> if, you, if you sonify this, then this is the Guinea Radio program that's decoding things. And you can configure the space probe to broadcast the data back down at different rates. So if it's really, really far away, you choose a slow rate. If it's close up, you can go up at a higher rate. And consider also that this is a spacecraft that doesn't have a computer on it. It only has simple shift registers and sequences. There's no memory. So any data that's collected by the science instruments has to be sent back to the Earth in real time. Because this is really old technology. And if you consider, it's probably part of the reason why it was able to survive so long in the depths of space. Because it didn't really have very complicated electronics on board. So it, you can go to higher rate, which is 64 bits per second. That one. And you can see here it come up out of the noise as the dish packs in. And you can see, you can hear rather that it's operating a bit faster. So one of the more common rates we use was 512. Faster again. And if you listen carefully, I'll use my hand to indicate, you can hear when the frame rolls over to the next one in the transmission. So if data comes out in frames. And you can hear the, the synchronization sequence for the frame. Can everyone hear that? And so this is again applying the same techniques that you saw with the pages guy. Looking at the rate of the data, looking at the synchronization sequence, all sort of related stuff, you know, whether you're looking at different sorts of technology. And here you can see the raw data coming in. That raw data is then used to build up these things called subcoms. So there's the analog subcom, digital subcom. They build up a sort of, sort of different subframe. And then the data from those subframes are pulled out to populate um, the intelligible information that we are interested in regarding the state of the probe. So here we have things like command counters and the spacecraft clock and the reported signal strength from the space probe. And then if you click them on the screen, then you get the one that I showed you before with the propulsion system. And then you can even go in a blistering 2K, which sounds a little bit different again. So here, in addition to the, that raw output, I wrote a little bit of extra Python with matplotlib to graph things in real time. And this was sort of important when we were trying to do the thrust of maneuvers. So there's an accelerometer on the space probe, but every time you actually want to activate one of the thrusters, you expect an impulse to be registered by the accelerometer. And we were really hopeful that we would see that consistently. The very first maneuver we did was to spin the probe back up again, because it was spinning a little bit slower than it should have been. And that worked, and we were overjoyed. And then to actually do the correction maneuver to bring it back into orbit around the Earth, we needed to fire some other thrusters. And every time we would do that, unfortunately, we would see maybe one little impulse at the beginning, but it, every time it rotated, it should have fired the thruster, but it would just commonly flatline. And every time we do that, you can see here that there's no real impulse being registered by the accelerometer. And this was a big letdown. This is the propulsion system. There are two independent sets of tanks, um, you know, independent redundant latch valves and um, thrusters there. No matter what combination of things we did or we tried to use in the program, we just couldn't get the thing to fire. And unfortunately, one of the theories is that apart from 
there being fuel on board, which was indicated by both the NASA logs and if you looked at the reports of the temperature probes on the space probe, you could turn the tank heaters on and off. And if you consider that a tank, if it has something inside it, it will have a different thermal mass. And so it will heat up and cool down at a different rate compared to if it was empty. And so my colleagues did some analysis there, and that was also indicative of there being fuel on board. But you need nitrogen pressuring to push the fuel out of a tank. So initially when it was launched, they put nitrogen in there to pressurize the tanks. And if you consider this is 30 years old, over that period of time, there might have been a very, very small and slow leak, and so the nitrogen might have just disappeared and left it in the state that it's in. So unfortunately, we couldn't bring it back into orbit around the Earth. It has since done the lunar flyby as the orbit would have, the original orbit would have made it uh, do, and then it's it just gone back out of the solar system. We did manage to turn some science instruments back on, so for a short period we did manage to get some decent science data. But since then, it floated a little bit higher out of the plane of the solar system, and because some additional subsystems were enabled, there wasn't enough power being collected from the solar panels, and the probe rebooted itself and went into safe mode. And unfortunately, the transponders are on the non-essential bus, and the default, which means they get reset, and the default state that they come back up in is receive only. So now we don't even get a carrier anymore, and so we don't really know where it is. So that was a bit of a shame. Um, but Google Creative Labs was nice enough to follow us around. They put together a documentary. Um, it was also supposed to have the live streaming data once everything was hunky-dory, but we didn't quite get there. If you're interested, you can go to Spacecraft for all um, pretty visualizations using WebGL and a nice video too. This is the team. Uh, mission Control was actually at an old McDonald's on Moffett Field Air Force Base in Silicon Valley. Uh, it was called McMoon's. They had a pi they've got a pirate flag in the window. Um, so to finish up then, the last two things I'd like to talk to you quickly about is aviation radar. Typical 747 has lots of different radios on board. Makes someone like me very happy. <laughs> um, ADSB is probably well known. This is where the secondary um, radar system is a, an active transponder on board that's constantly broadcasting this sort of information out of, about the airplane. And um, it uses this thing called pulse position modulation. Very, very fast modulation, which is why you need a software defined radio to sample at a higher rate. But once you end up for example, creating a Gooden radio decoder, you can see here the data frames being broadcast by all sorts of different aircraft at, at the different power levels, depending on the distance. Then you can take that, process the data, and then put it on a map. And so here, this is, at the time, it was live aircraft data coming down, and then you can visualize all the air traffic around the Bay Area. So you've got San Francisco Airport, Oakland, and um, San Jose, with all the planes landing and taking off. Uh, then you can look at these really interesting trail maps, color-coded altitude to see the flight paths and so on. And then because you have altitude, you can actually do it real-time in 3D in Google Earth, streamed over the web. I had this set up for Sydney the night before I left for the States, but since then um, I haven't been able to get it, get it running for various reasons. But this is a, a version America flight taking off from SFO, and you can spin around and, and see the rest of the bay there. And then in addition, you can create the virtual cockpit view, so it's as if you were the pilot sitting in the pilot seat taking off. And um, you can get a bit of a sense of what that would be like. I don't know about all this debris on the ground there, but um, you know it's it's pretty cool. You can see how the planes obviously come in from this point of view, and as you swing around, then you get to see the Bay Bridge and San Francisco. Uh, and then when I was running it for Sydney, this is Sydney now. Again, you have all the aircraft there, but there's another communication system called ACARS, the Aircraft Communication and Reporting System, and they send things like waypoints and air traffic control information and the engines will send performance data back to Rolls Royce. And this is mostly in the clear. So every time a message is sent to or from a particular aircraft, it spatially tags it on the map and shows you that information in a balloon. And these white lines here are actually the waypoints that have been sent for a particular flight, so you can get an idea of where it's going to fly. Uh, now that's the secondary system. The primary system obviously you might recognize with these big radars spinning at the airport they send out a very strong pulse of energy, and then they listen for the echo that will come off metallic bodies like the fuselage in an aircraft. And so here, this scope is being uh, triggered by that initial big impulse, and then the, again so you can see, what caught my eye was that following the big bang, when, while it, the radar is listening for the echoes, there's actually some energy being registered here shortly after the, the initial transmission. My radio is just listening on the frequency the entire time. So I thought, well, let's look at that a little bit closer. The radar returns, as I said, you have this high energy bang, 
and then it listens for the echoes to come back until it sends the next bang out. It, that happens periodically. And if you look at the signal that I recorded, keep in mind that all this is just being recorded using this. I went out to a hill near the radar, near the Air Force Base. I'm just using a little antenna like this. I'm not using anything like that big high gain antenna that's actually on the radar itself. So I wrote a bit of software to synchronize to the radar signal and detect the bangs. And so this is being triggered again by the initial bang. And then you can see here that there's some energy coming back immediately after that. Now, if you take that and then you render it as a raster plot, you get this. So each scan line here at the left-hand side is being triggered by that initial transmission from the radar. And then it listens for a certain amount of time. And every uh, scan line then is a new bang that's being transmitted by the radar. So th this here is actually one complete revolution of the radar. And every bit of energy that comes back and is being received by my radio. So here you have the initial bang. Here you have what's called ground clutter, which is quite close in. And then you get these interesting shapes emerging. And what happens is you can take this and then do a polar unwrap, put it on a map, and then what do you know? Those interesting curved shapes suddenly become straight. And it actually turns out to be the power line pylons that are sitting on the water in the bay that's reflecting the energy from the radar back into my radio. Also, you have the bridges that cross the bay there. They're also reflecting some energy. And then around the bay itself, you've got large structures and buildings that are reflecting some of the energy too. So if you record for longer and get multiple rotations of the radar, you can take the first one, one of the middle ones, and the last one, and then apply them into the red, the green, and the blue channels in a color image respectively. So if everything's static and nothing is moving, you expect all the returns to be roughly to be the same, and so you'll get everything appearing in white. However, if something moves, what are you going to get? Color. So, for example, here you have this RGB triplet appearing, and this is some target that was moving during that rotation of the radar. And if you do the unwrapping of that, it actually turns out that it was just, I think, on the, on the shore of the bay somewhere. And this is just a guess, I don't know for sure. But it might have been a truck moving quite slowly based upon the, the rate at which it was spinning and the, the separation of the pixels there. You know, if a truck is, is facing me and the radar, then the side of the truck will provide a, a nice radar cross section and then send a bit of that energy back. Um, and this is, you know, all, all without a big antenna. If you amped up the, the scenario, you probably receive um, uh, airplanes as well. But that's future work. So to finish up then, last thing will be RFID. A couple of interesting apps there. I was driving around San Francisco and I saw these Yagi antennas pointed down into the lanes on the roadway. I was wondering what the hell that was for. So I took up my own Yagi, pointed it back up there and recorded the signal. <laughs> trying to figure out what it was. Turned out that it was actually Fast Track, which is the equivalent of ePass. Is it ePass? Um, and so I went also looking very inconspicuous to the Golden Gate Bridge toll booth and recording the signal. It turned out to be the same thing. So interestingly here, they're going to create a transaction, but with this one on the street there, they're just reading everyone's tags. It's not going to beep on you when you drive under, but they can track everyone. So <laughs> Fast Track is interesting because it uses this thing called backscatter modulation. The reader, the interrogator, will actually wake the tag up and send it a payload, which interestingly uses pole position modulation, like with MODES, like with the aircraft thing, the same modulation scheme. But the tag itself has a long life lithium battery. It never actually actively transmits a signal back to the reader. What happens is it has a receive antenna, which listens for the wake up and the payload, but then it has a, let's call it a passive transmit antenna. And the radar cross section of that transmit antenna is changed by the microcontroller in the tag. So as that radar cross section is changed, it's actually being modulated with the data that the tag wants to send back to the reader. And so that energy signature, the reader's reading, will change. And that will actually be conveying the data back up. And you can actually see that here. So this is the wake up signal. You have the preamble. And then you have the payload that, in this case, is telling the tag to respond with its ID. And then what happens is you have this unmodulated backscatter carrier. So the reader is energizing the tag. It's sending down this carrier wave. And that carrier wave will be reflected but it'll be changed in a manner that actually conveys the digital signal from the tag back to the reader. And you can see that in a second. But to get it happening, if you consider that you have a separate transmit and receive port, then you can use a circulator to actually 
plug them into a single antenna that will now both act as a transmitter and a receiver. It's a neat little device. And so, again, a GNU radio program. Here we've got the payload, and then we've got our carrier there. And when I hold the tag up, you can see suddenly you've got some backscatter energy appearing on the carrier. And if you demodulate that, you get my tag ID. And again, this is all in the clear. So you could go and stand on a bridge, point it down onto the roadway and read everyone's tag. Or worse, you can spoof a tag. So when you actually do a little bit of experiment, we've got the, uh, the tag there behind the windshield. Just hold the antenna up and then it's it read it straight away. Uh, and this is the GNU radio flow graph that runs that. A little bit more complicated, but the guts of it is in this fast track decoder block. And um, yeah, so that, that's interesting that it's, it's all sort of in the clear like that. Um, the other thing is, you know, key fobs and building security, you can get a coil, hold it up, and it's the same idea again. So you have this energy that's energizing the chip in your <coughs> key card, you know, even with PayPass and PayWave, and same idea. And then the reader will transmit something, and then it'll wait for this backscatter to come back from the tag. And so you can similarly analyze the signal there if you want. Um, the final thing on this topic is the keyless entry. I was just interested in how this actually worked. One of my colleagues has a Prius, so we got his remote, hooked it up to one of the radios. And what turns out is that the car is constantly broadcasting a low frequency signal. It's saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And the remote control has a three axis low frequency pickup. So when it hears that, wake up, it'll wake up the remote, and then respond back to the car or the UHF, which is usually what's used when you press the button on the remote. And the car will then send a cryptographic challenge to the remote, and the remote will do some computation, and then send the cryptographic response back to the car. And if everything matches up, then it will unlock. And I thought it'd be interesting to try and get into the middle of this. So what if you could potentially remove the physically the remote move it elsewhere and use these radios to provide a relay link between the two sides of the equation. Now I had a feeling this wouldn't work for a very concrete and obvious, well, initially obvious reason, uh, but I thought it'd be interesting just to try it out anyway to see what the signals were. So I've got this radio, this one here is again the X310, it can listen on two different frequencies at the same time, so it's simultaneously receiving the LF from the car and the UHF from the remote. And if you look at what's happening from the car, the car will first send the wake up when it hears the remote reply back, it'll send the ID and then the challenge. And then the remote itself will send back an act, another act, and then the cryptographic response. So you can receive these both at the same time and see how it all aligns in time. So the blue is these periodic broadcasts from the car and the red is the response from the remote. And if you look at that, you can see here it's happening periodically and every so often there's some other activity there. So this is an example of the wake up being received in Gunnar Radio and the challenge. Here, this is one side of the equation where you have this coil on the car, it's going into an up converter and then the 210, and this other one, this B210, is ready to transmit UHF back to the car, like that. Now, this is all being packetized, and, and the transport mechanism from this laptop is actually Wi-Fi back into the office. So in the office, inside I have this X310 that's going to that coil, there's a loop back so that I can check the signal is coming out properly, and what I expect to come out of that coil is what's actually coming out of the car. So the car's going to transmit something, it's going to be shipped over Wi-Fi here and then rebroadcast it here. And so you can have that set up there, LF to the coil, and then UHF, whatever the remote transmits will be picked up by that radio and then rebroadcast outside. So I put the, ra the remote there, and what do you know? It actually heard what the car was transmitting and then sent the initial ACK over UHF back outside. So this is VNC to the laptop outside, it's detecting the, the ID being sent by the car. The wake up, that's actually being heard inside as well by the loopback, and as you can see there, this energy signature is what the remote transmitted out, because it thinks that it's next to the car. Yeah, you, so you can't do the replay attack because the cryptographic challenge response is unique every single time. Um, so here, it's obviously hearing the car responding with the initial acknowledgement. And at this point, um, this is going back outside and this is VNC to the outside laptop again and it's rebroadcasting that outside back to the car. So at this point, I didn't even bother looking any further. I was really excited and I thought, oh, I'll just run out to the car and see, you know, blind luck. It probably won't work, but what the hell. So you can see that it's, it's going off there every so often, being broadcast back outside. So I'd run outside and just, just 
and have a look to see. Knowing really that it wouldn't work, and I was hoping that it wouldn't work because if they hadn't designed it properly, this would be a gaping security hole, obviously. And there's a very good reason why it didn't work. Can anybody hazard a guess? Yes, that's exactly right. It's the latency of the system. So the problem is that I'm going into one radio, into the laptop, over Wi-Fi to another ra computer, then to a radio, and then to another radio, and then obviously it all ends up. And that latency ends up killing the system. The relay system. And if you actually look at how the LF and the UHF aligns in time, you can see then in this time domain plot that it happens very, very quickly. So as soon as there's one transmission from the car, the remote responds straight away, and then the car responds immediately after that. This all happens in a very, very time constrained fashion. And happily, they've implemented things properly so that if there's a response after some timeout, then it will reset the state machine, and then you'll have to just go from scratch. So it's just interesting to look at the protocol. And theoretically, if you were to go from one radio outside to another radio inside directly over, say, 1 gig or 10 gig Ethernet, which is something that I'm going to try and do later on um, with some new technology we're working on, you remove the computer from the equation. Unfortunately, because you now have a cable running between the radios, you can't just... My, my devious thinking was if you um, did all this over like an LTE link or something, you could have quite a bit of a distance um, so you won't be able to do that, but maybe just straight over cable. It might get down to these sort of um, latency values to enable you to do that. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what exactly that um, that window is that they have on their spec. Well, you can <coughs> Potentially. Um, but then this happens awfully quickly, and they might do interesting um, you know, rounding of when the transmission goes out, depending upon the ID of the car, they might take that and then say, they actually might use some time slot for a drone, and I'm just keep all of it. Oh, it's just like you can buy the already fire stuff that allows you to use the device and run it back. Right, but is that, is that with the rolling code when you press the button? Or, so or with the original one, uh -huh. and um, it was installed four layers, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because remember, this system that I'm talking about here with the crypto challenge response, is distinct from the rolling code where you actually push the button on the remote. On the remote. So that's more the traditional remote control system where you have uh, normal with, with your car where you press the button. Um, so just to finish up then, um, in the Bay Area I've started this SDR meetup. We meet monthly. It alternates between the Valley and San Francisco. It's basically a forum where people that are interested in software defined rating can come out and talk about projects that they've been working on. Um, somebody's keen to set one up on the east coast of the state, so somebody's trying to set one up in Europe as well. I would love there to be one in Australia. Um, so if you want to, you know, consider that I'll plant that seed there. Um, that would be great to have it you know, spread more globally. But um, that brings me to the end. So thank you very much for your attention.